Here we go. Welcome everyone, Danielle Matthews here. I'm really excited uh, for this interview this morning. I have Hunter Dean with me. And uh, for those of you that aren't aware, we do a monthly call in the VIP customer group. So all things ASEA are in that VIP customer group. We wanna continue the education. We know that there is a lot when you're learning about a breakthrough health technology, there's a lot to take in. And there are some ways to get the most out of the product. And so we like to continue to add value, continue your ability to learn about really the capacity of what you have your hands on and how it can how it can best be utilized. And today's conversation, though, we are going to focus on production and distribution. Uh, there are some fascinating things. I have been blessed to go to the ASEA Redox facility I don't know, coming on like at least eight times and have gotten tours every time I learned something new. And the last time Hunter himself took me through that tour and it was absolutely fabulous. So I'm going to give him a little intro and then we'll we'll dive into things. So for those of you that have not had the pleasure of meeting Hunter, uh, Hunter is our VP of Production Operations at ASEA. He has a BS in chemical engineering that he got from BYU, Brigham Young University, and he has been with ASEA for just under five years. Uh, he is a wealth of knowledge, I will say this, and just a beautiful soul, um, such a, uh, so incredibly smart, so intelligent, has a beautiful way of articulating things, and I feel blessed uh, to get to spend some time. So welcome, Hunter, and I'm glad uh, you said yes to a Saturday morning conversation. Thank you so much for having me, Danielle. Yeah, absolutely. So let's dive in. <laughs> I think uh, I love to just jump jump right into things. And the biggest question that everyone seems to have with redox signaling, right? The breakthrough is that we got these molecules stable. And so the question is, how is ASEA actually made? Because it looks like it's just saline. Um, why is it no longer just salt and water? And what are you guys doing with it over there? Yeah, yeah. So this breakthrough technology, it's really interesting because you know, a lot of people hear, oh, you know, salt water from Salt Lake City, what's that about, right? Um, the the process is, is certainly a, um, complicated in, in that um, signaling molecules are, are highly reactive. They're high energy molecules. In order for your cells to create a signal, they need energy. And so in order to um, create that energy, we have to create molecules that are high energy molecules, and those are highly reactive. And so you, you mentioned it, stability. Right. Um, at every step in the process, we have to make sure that we are using the purest components possible while making this product, because any impurities can denature um, the product and can affect the stability of the product. Um, but really at the heart of our manufacturing process is our is our proprietary and patented electrolysis process. The the signaling molecules are formed by electrolysis. Let me come back here. Uh, wonderful. And something that I've always found really interesting when you start the tour, before we even go into the facility and see the production, see those machines that are doing the electrolysis, there's all these things hanging on the wall. And last time I was there, you got into a conversation about the, cert the certifications you all have and the fact that the, the facility is registered with the FDA. So can you talk to us about what it means? Like the product is not FDA approved but our facility is registered with the FDA. And I think there's nuance here that I want people to understand. Certainly, yeah. So we are not FDA approved because we do not fall into a product category that um, falls under the jurisdiction of the FDA. As a nutritional supplement, we don't, we don't look to the FDA for regulatory concerns. Um, however, um, as a manufacturer, um, we have notified the FDA of our location and what it is that we're doing here. That's what it means to be listed with the FDA. Um, and an interesting point is, is last year they came out and audited our facility. Um, and for those of you who aren't as familiar with FDA audits, they are, they are in depth. They are very thorough when they come through the plant. Um, an FDA audit has over 2000 points of inspection. Um, and so they're going to be looking into things like how do you clean your equipment? What equipment do you use? How do you train your employees? How do you control your documents? What do you maintain your documents? How do you do that? Um, they're going to look at every single step of the process. And so each one of those 2000 bullet points will actually have sub points as well. So it's a very, very thorough process, a very thorough audit that they go through. And one of the things that we're most proud of is that 
at the end of the audit, she went through those 2000 points of inspection complete with all the sub points. And the auditor said, you know, I probably shouldn't say this, but you guys should teach audit readiness. <laughs> um, it was it was something we were really happy about. We're really proud of because an FDA audit is extremely thorough and we had nothing but glowing remarks from the auditor. So that's something that we're really, really proud of. Yeah, you guys have it together there. It's a beautiful facility. I mean, it's it's so clean. And um, there were other certifications. So can you talk to me about, you know, the other certifications that our, our facility has and the product has, WADA, Halal, all those things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the first one I'd like to mention is NSF. So um, because we are a nutritional supplement, um, we actually um, work with the NSF, pay the NSF to come out and audit us every single year. Um, the NSF will make sure that we are manufacturing in accordance with GMP, good manufacturing practice guidelines. Um, and so every single year they come out and they audit us. Um, and for several years now, we've maintained nothing but an A rating with the NSF. So that's another thing we're really proud of. Um, in addition to the NSF, we have something called NSF Sport. Um, this is really important for those of you who are um, speaking with athletes that have athletes in your organization. The NSF Sport Certification certifies that we have no banned or illicit substances that are used in the Redox Center where we make the product. Um, and so that one's really important for those athletes out there that are, you know, competing and want to make sure that they're, you know, abiding by the rules. That NSF Sport Certification um, guarantees that the uh, the Blue Bottle ARS Acia Redox Supplement is is uh, compliant with uh, the competitions or the sports regulations. Um, in addition to NSF sport, you mentioned WADA. WADA um, pertains particularly to the cell performance products because WADA is basically a test on an ingredient set. So because our cell performance line, our mind, mood, and energy are ingredients-based, um, we have them tested for WADA compliance. World Anti-Doping Agency is what that stands for. And again, that one just certifies that those formulas, those products are completely free of any banned or illicit substances as far as um, the world of sports is concerned. In addition to the WADA certification, we have um, ISO certification for our cosmetic products. Um, so Renew Advanced, Renew 28, Intensive Redox Serum, the new clay mask. Um, that, that's gonna um, be our certificate that pertains to the cosmetic and topical products. Um, we are also kosher and halal certified on all of our products. Um, and then there are a couple other ones, the Utah Agricultural Certification and the, the Free Sale Certification. And what those do is those allow us to manufacture products in the state of Utah and export them over state lines and export them internationally as well. And so a lot, a lot of different certifications in order to keep things moving at the Redox Center. And we pride ourselves um, in the fact that we are always ready for an audit. Some of those audits, like the, the free sale and the agricultural um, certifications, require a surprise audit. They'll mm -hmm. just show up. They'll come into the front office and say, hey, show me around. I'm from, you know, Department of Agriculture. I need to take a look at your facility. And that's nothing that we're ever worried about because we are always ready for audits. We're always operating as if we're being audited that day. And so that's something we really pride ourselves at the Redox Center. Yeah, I was blown away. You know, I... I mean, it's ignorance on my part. I had no idea what goes into making a product and what's required for the facility that manufactures it. And then also, you know, all these questions that people have, especially athletes, you know, that want to be able to be compliant with their sport. Uh, I'm, I'm blown away and very grateful <laughs> that you guys go into that depth and that level of detail. And to me, it seems like you go a little above and beyond uh, is the sense that I got when I was there. Um, you know, you're like beyond even best practice of manufacturing. Now, there was a question in the chat that said, what does NSF mean? You might have said this, but if you could repeat. Yeah, so it's actually pretty funny. So it, it used to stand for something, but when we asked the auditor, what does it stand for? Because we had the question ourselves, the, the auditor actually said it doesn't stand for anything anymore after the restructuring of, 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 the, of the organization. So it used to stand for National Sanitation Foundation. Okay. Um, but now it's just NSF. There's no, there's no acronym. There's no nothing. So it's, I, I don't know why that is, but that, that's the information we got from the auditor. <laughs> that's funny. There's leftover remnants from the past. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
So another question that I know a lot of people have and something that I found interesting when I came there was about the patents versus intellectual property. So a lot of people talk about the fact that, you know, our redox signaling technology is proprietary, the blue and the white, right? It's It's got a lot of patents on it, but I heard a lot of talk about, no, we actually are transitioning using more intellectual property. Can you talk to us about, about why and what that means? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is actually a really interesting topic, and it's something that I'm I'm heavily involved with as far as the the strategy of of the corporate body of ASEA is concerned. So when you talk about ASEA Redox products, specifically um, the Blue Bottle Renew 28 Intensive Redox Serum and Clay Mask, um, they leverage our cell signaling technology. This is a breakthrough technology that nobody else has. Nobody else um, knows how to replicate. This is something that is very unique and has a competitive advantage on the market. And the strategy is the goal of this, um, this approach is to maintain that competitive advantage. And so you talked about, we have some patents um, pertaining to the, the process, some of the applications of the product. Um, the challenge with patents is that patents will sunset, right? At some point, patents sunset. And when you file a patent, they become public knowledge. And so these patents are written in a way to not give away the farm, so to speak. They kind of are broad in their scope and kind of allow us to have some flexibility in, in what we're divulging. But we have made some serious advancements on the technology over the last five years. And we have decided from a strategic standpoint that we want to make sure that those are not public knowledge, that we are the only ones that know how to do that. Um, there are probably thousands of points of intellectual property at this point, as far as the manufacturing process goes, as far as the understanding of the product goes. And so what happens is, is now when you hold that as a trade secret or intellectual property, you do not have to um, divulge that to the public. You don't have to make that public knowledge. And so when you think about things like the Coca-Cola formula, mm -hmm. right? There's no patent on the Coca-Cola formula. They just guard it very closely. And so nobody knows what the Coca-Cola formula is, and it allows them to be the successful business they are today um, after decades and decades of doing business. And so our strategy is to combine trade secrets and intellectual property with the original patents in order to protect our competitive advantage in the marketplace. Beautiful. I'm, I'm grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm grateful that ASEA has this and ASEA alone does. Um, so there was a question, I don't know if you could speak to this, uh, over in the customer group, people are saying, well, with these certifications, going back to NSF, um, if you have to pay the organization, won't they always give you a good report? And people are saying, is that not just a self-fulfilling prophecy? Sure. Yeah, no. So the, the, the payment is the cost of the audit. They by no means give us an A grade because we're paying them. There's a lot of people that do not get good grades from the NSF. And what this allows us to do is, is to make sure that if the FDA were to come and look at our facility, we know that we are abiding by FDA standards. An A grade from the NSF is co closely co correlated to what the FDA would audit when in our facility. And so it's, it's a measuring stick, so to speak. And so they're not doing their job if they give us an A rating just because we're paying them, right? The value of the audit is the rating itself and being able to check up on how we're doing. Beautifully explained. Thank you, Ellen. Hopefully that helps you. Um, all right. Next question is about, you know, some of the things that, that you do to test the redox. So something that I was really impressed with, like there's a whole room uh, where it looks like you guys are doing a lot of, you know, what's the concentration of the redox in here and also making sure that, hey, these molecules are stable and, you know, heat and other things aren't impacting it. So can you talk to me about the testing that's done at the facility to make sure you've got the right concentration, to make sure every batch is the same and that we are getting the redox that we believe we are getting? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a stability program at ASEA that is very robust. And what I mean by stability program is that every single lot number of product that is manufactured in the facility, we retain samples of that product and we test that product throughout its expiration date. So from beginning day one, all the way 21 months later, we test that product throughout the expiration date at varying temperatures and humidity. Yeah. And so when we have customers in the Asian markets 
you know, it takes a long time to get it on a boat from, from Utah, you know, all the way to Taiwan or all the way, you know, to these different Asian markets. And they, they'll call in sometimes and they'll ask like, Hey, is my product okay? It's sitting on this hot Connex container for, you know, six, seven, eight weeks. Is it okay? Is it stable? And because of our robust stability program, where we test all the way down to freezing and all the way up to 120, 130 degrees Fahrenheit, we can confidently say, yes, the signaling molecules are there. Um, and so that happens with every single lot on every product that we manufacture at the Redox Center. Um, as far as testing goes, um, that's, that's kind of the stability portion of it. The other side is kind of the efficacy and concentration of the signaling molecules kind of side of the coin. Um, Every single lot of product that we make, um, we test several times before it is packaged, um, both internally and then we send tests out to third party labs for verification. And those numbers have to match in order for us to package the product. And so every single product um, lot goes through not only our stability testing, but several rounds of tests from our quality department testing salinity, testing pH, testing the concentration of signaling molecules, we're testing for purity. Um, there are several parameters that we're testing for multiple times along different parts of the process and then validating that at the end with third-party results before it's even packaged. And so when we get questions, hey, is my product good? Is my product have the signaling molecules in it? We do all of this so that we can answer confidently, yes, your product is safe, it's effective, and it's stable. Beautiful. Now, based on some of the things you've done, I mean, what would you tell us, like, what are things that you found that you shouldn't do with a SEA or things that do impact degradation? Like, I think I've heard maybe UV light or can you talk to us about that? Yeah. So um, I think you can definitely get wrapped around the weeds as far as stability goes. So let's, let's, let's be a little careful when we talk about this is I want, I want you guys to understand when we're talking about these concepts, we're talking a few percentage points of signaling molecules being denatured or, or degraded, right? So yes, um, they are photochemically active. And what that means is the signaling molecules can react to sunlight. Um, that's the reason behind the blue opaque sleeve around what would otherwise be a clear bottle is to, to minimize kind of some of that, that um, photochemical reactivity, that, that reaction with sunlight. The other thing I would avoid is microwaving. I haven't heard of anybody doing it. Um, but signaling molecules would be reactive to microwaves as well. Um, and then any contact with metal, right? Um, you want to avoid contact with, with metal. Metal contains minerals um, and signaling molecules will denature upon contact with minerals as well. Wonderful. And there's a quick question in the chat from Amanda asking, do these temperatures apply to the gel as well? She said she accidentally left it in her car and it got super hot and she's wondering if it's still good. Yeah, every product. Every single product that ASEA offers, we're, t we're testing at a, a wide range, uh, array of, uh, of temperature ranges. Okay. And then what about if it goes through like the x-ray thing at the airport? This is a question that Ingrid has. Yeah. Um, x-rays are going to denature the product, but the number of x-rays passing through the product at the airport are fairly minimal. Um, and so again, we're talking a few percentage points, a couple percentage points of efficacy loss. So you're going from 100% efficacy to 99.5% efficacy, <laughs> right? So, so when we talk about these stability things, a lot of people will really get concerned about things. And, and from a technical perspective, yes, they do react, um, but you're talking really minimal, minimal amounts of loss here. Yeah, we're not ruining our products. So <laughs> yep, yep. that's good. Wonderful. And that's, that's really the, that's really the, the magic, I guess, so to speak, behind this product is the stability of it. Really, that is our competitive advantage, right? Other people can can technically create signaling molecules, but it's the stability of this product, the deliverability of this product that is magic, right? That, that is, is so, so unique and so competitive in the marketplace. Wonderful. So this question, uh, you know, I've had people on like YouTube writing comments and I've, I've seen people sending me things saying, hey, I took the ASEA to my friend's lab and we tested it and you know the ph is this and it, you know it says that this is supposed to be in it and we're not detecting any redox molecules and i'm i'm curious <laughs> uh, because my understanding is you need pretty sophisticated equipment to actually identify the redox so taking it and doing like your own testing at home i isn't potent enough but could you speak to that a little bit because i think people 
maybe get a little confused and then concerned because they're like, wait, what's in this stuff? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there, there's been quite a bit of that kind of over the last four or five years, people kind of digging in. And I think that comes from the overall interest that's growing um, worldwide in redox, right? A lot of people are seeing, hey, you know, this is really something that can can help people's health. Um, conventions and everything are coming together to discuss redox and cellular health. Um, so I, I think it's only natural that we're going to start getting these questions and probably get more of them more frequently. Um, and so what I want to clarify is um, these, there are a lot of test methods that are kind of simple te test methods. One example that comes to mind is, is like hot tub tests and um, pool testing strips and things like that. These are rudimentary tests that assume that what you are testing are specific chemical species, right? They are calibrated for things you will find in a hot tub, in a pool. There are other compounds, totally different compounds, that will elicit a similar response to the test, despite being something completely different. And that's because it's just a generic test looking for a specific compound. These aren't wide encompassing tests. They're, they're, they're purpose built, so to speak, right? And so a lot of times when you use them outside of what they were intended for, they'll give strange results. And so that's the explanation kind of behind some of those rudimentary test methods. The other explanation that I have is, is for those who are looking at, oh, I brought this to this lab. They weren't able to find something. A lot of labs will look for specific compounds when you look at, um, when, when you request something. Say, hey, I want to test this for signaling molecules. Well, they're going to say, okay, well, I think that's this, this, and this. They test for it. They are looking very specifically for those two or three that you told them, hey, I want to look for these. If our product leverages different signaling molecules because there's several species, they're not going to see it, right? The other thing I want to talk to is, is these tests um, at the levels we perform them are extremely expensive. And the reason for that is we are testing these products at part per million, part per billion, and part per trillion levels, right? And so when you bring in a sample, unless you're paying big money to have it analyzed, these labs are not going to spend the resources to test products to that level and to that, that, um, that exactitude. Amazing. That was the best response I've ever gotten on that question. <laughs> <So> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to listen to that again. Um, so a question that's coming up, what is the pH, like, what is the pH supposed to be? What is the pH of the liquid, ASEA, when it's all done? And then uh, same, same question about the gel. Yeah, um, the pH of the liquid, our spec is between seven and eight. Um, and that's the, what's interesting is, is the, the pH of the product actually rises during the electrolysis process. As we're forming the signaling molecules, it becomes more alkaline, it becomes more basic. Um, and then we we add a pH balancer to bring it back down to a seven or eight um, in that in that ballpark as far as the the blue bottle is concerned. Now, as far as um, Renew 28, the gel, we will actually drop that pH lower um, because the pH of the skin is six and a half. It's 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 actually um, mildly acidic is, is where your skin likes to be. And so we actually bring the pH of the Renew 28 down to match that of the skin. Interesting. And now uh, let's talk about Renew 28 for a moment. So people like to talk about the concentration. Is it accurate to say that the Renew 28 is a little bit more concentrated in redox signaling than the liquid? Yes. Yeah. Um, because it's topically, right, we can get away with a higher concentration of signaling molecules. Um, this is kind of in flux as far as the relationship of how many times more concentrated is is it than uh than the blue bottle um because what happens is, is we're always looking at our processes and we're always wanting to improve them and improve the product right so if we come up with a, a breakthrough that allows us to cram more signaling molecules into renew 28 we're not gonna wait <laughs> right we're just gonna, we're gonna go to the board and say hey we got this thing we want to make renew better they're going to give us the thumbs up. We'll go and we'll, we'll implement the change. So these numbers kind of fluctuate a little bit based on where our technology is at. Um, but you can you can assume that Renew is two to four times more potent um, than than uh, the blue bottle. Nice. Awesome. And then I got this little baby in the mail. Yep. 
So can you talk to us? Because this is very exciting. We haven't had a new redox signaling technology in a super long time. Uh, can you talk to us about the clay mask a little bit? And um, I heard it took like 200 attempts. Is that accurate? To like get this to a stable form in the form that I've got it now doing what it's doing? At least 200. Um, <laughs> Henry, Henry was going back to his lab books um, and he found clay mask notes from three years ago. Um, and so this is this has been a long time coming. Um, and really, it kind of stems from our strategy as a science team as a whole. Um, and ASEA's kind of strategy moving forward on pushing the science forward. Um, three years ago, when COVID started, we had kind of some tough macroeconomic headwinds, right? A lot of people were, were struggling. Things were tough. Supply lines were challenged. Um, and ASEA took the approach of, hey, Let's control what we can control and let's invest in our internal capabilities. So we put our money where our mouth is. We hired a bunch of very talented individuals um, onto the science team. We dumped a ton of money into R&D. Uh, we dumped some money into improving our lab capabilities. And this allowed us to begin to work on the technology in different ways that we couldn't before. Um, and so when we talk about the clay mask, the clay mask is an interesting case study because there are ingredients in the clay mask that traditionally you would say would denature signaling molecules, right? Mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and that's why it's, it's so significant that this is a cell signaling product and that the, the schedule of release of these signaling products is, is so slow is because it is very challenging to come up with formulas that maintain the stability of these signaling molecules. And so this is really a breakthrough product for us in how we approach the stability of signaling molecules and products moving forward. Yeah, that was, I was like, how'd they do that? I thought when I touched like organic things, it starts denaturing. <laughs> it's amazing that they figured this out. So yeah, 200 attempts or more, way to go. Yeah, this is this is the only clay mask on the market that leverages the power of signaling molecules. We're really excited about it. Yeah, and it's phenomenal. And just so you guys know, because I know this is a global call right now, sorry, it's just available in the US. <laughs> but if it goes well in the US and people are loving it, it will be available globally. So uh, I'm already hearing testimonials and seeing pictures. And it's like the before and after of just like one use of the mask. It's pretty remarkable. So uh, I have a hunch it'll it'll get to everybody around the world. Um, talking about that, can you speak to us about like distributing this product? Cause it's pretty amazing. That blew me away at the warehouse I was actually seeing distribution. So you are responsible. We make all of our products in-house, the signaling products in-house in the U S and then it gets shipped globally to different facilities. Yes. Like how do you know the demand? How do you kind of keep track of this? Yeah. So we have, um, I work with the team, um, under Brad Jackman and, and David Jensen that uh, we have an entire team dedicated to logistics. Um, they, they're tracking burn rates in different countries. They're, uh, they're working through and making sure that we're getting products shipped when it needs to get shipped. We have 33 international markets globally right now um, and over 21 points of distribution to help us with that. So um, everything that ships here in the United States comes out of the Redox Center. Um, those parcel shipments are all shipped by uh, a team in the Redox Center that ships those out um, as they come in. We also have a will call um, for, for local people here, here in Utah. Um, but then what happens is, is we'll have trucks go out every single day um, to begin shipping Connex containers um, all around the world. Those will, those will arrive at 3PLs or third-party logistics partners. Um, they'll break those down and then they'll handle in-country domestic shipping from there. Um, so it's this kind of lattice work of, of shipping points and things like that to get to all 33 markets. But our logistics team is, is highly talented um, and good at what they do. Yeah, I was blown away during all the craziness with the, with the pandemic. It was amazing that it kept flowing. Um, one question that comes up a lot, why do the, uh, like, why is that blue bottle, the sleeve, look different in different countries? How come the label is different? Yeah, um, so we talked about 33 different countries right now. Every single one of those countries have their own laws and regulatory bodies. And so every single one of those countries has input on what needs to be, or requirements, uh, on what needs to be on the bottle. And so not only do we have to find out how do we ship it to all of these different places, 
but we have to be regulatorily compliant in those countries and those markets as well. And so depending on which country we're shipping to, we'll use a unique sleeve or unique packaging or, or, or case in some cases where it has the information that is required from regulatory agencies in that market. Makes sense. So the last question I have for you, and guys, I do see the chat and all of you on there asking questions. Uh, we will make a little bit of time for that. But the last question I have to you, Hunter, because I found this fascinating, um, the research, like what is the continued research that ASEA is doing on the products? And is it all in-house? Do you outsource? And you know what might we be able to expect with that? Yeah, as far as internal research goes, we've actually just recently added um, an ICPMS to our test capabilities. This is going to be um, allow us to test down to parts per trillion in some cases. And that's going to help us look analytically at at what are the trace compounds in our products as we develop them. Um, so that's kind of an internal an investment into our, our studies. Um, but we have university research partners worldwide right now. Um, part of the, again, we talk about that difficult time with COVID and then those macroeconomic headwinds. One of the strategies was let's, let's, let's invest some money into um, research. And so we have a significant yearly research budget um, that we have partners in Chile, we have them in uh, Spain, Australia, Germany, the UK, here in the US. Um, we have partners all over the world looking at this product. And what's actually exciting is, is we now have people calling us um, to see if they can be involved with their research. Um, and so we're, we're really excited about where we're going. You know, the vision of ASEA is to be the leaders in redox and cellular health. Um, and so by partnering with these different universities globally, um, we are committed to achieving that, that vision. Um, and so we're looking into things like the compounds in ASEA um, and how they work in the body, right? We want to look at those specific pathways in the body. Hey, what, what's happening when we take ASEA? And what that'll allow us to do is, is to understand how it works in the body and then what happens is there's this unique cycle of if you understand what happens in the body, you can calibrate your product better. Once you've calibrated your product better, more things happen in the body. And so there's this cycle of research that happens and they kind of feed each other. Um, and so we have some awesome, awesome things coming up. Um, Going to be ready to release probably around convention time. Hint, hint, plug, plug. Um, mm -hmm. If you're not planning on go to convention, shame on you. Get there if you can. Do everything you can. Um, but there's a lot of really exciting research going on right now. I can't quite speak to it yet, but it's coming soon. I'm so excited. I know when I heard that you guys had people calling you to want to study with the CIA, I was like, the word's getting out. Like when people understand what we have our hands on, um, yeah, I think they'll be knocking down the door. So uh, Hunter, do you have maybe, I don't know, 10 more minutes? We'll just kind of yeah. through the questions in the chat. Okay. So give yeah. me some guys. I see over on Facebook, I see you here on Zoom. So um, one question that Vicky had, kind of going back to the x-rays and a slight denaturing, the question is, wouldn't that start like a cascading effect and then all of the molecules be denatured? I think that question stems from people say, don't drink out of the bottle because your saliva gets in and causes this cascading effect of it all being denatured. So I'm guessing that's kind of where that comes from. Sure. Yeah, the, there's not necessarily a cascade effect in, in the denaturing process. Once a, once a cell signaling molecule becomes, I guess, inactive, let's say, it doesn't have the ability to, to denature the cell signaling molecules around it. Cool. Um, so the cascade effect is very real in the body as far as cell signaling goes, but not so much on, uh, on the degradation of the product. Very insightful. Okay, see, you got to go straight to the source, guys. <laughs> the answer's here. <laughs> All right, uh, the next question, there's several on cell performance. So uh, do the cell performance products work as well, better or worse, if they're put in alkaline water, pH 9 to 10, or is it best to use normal pH water for the cell performance like sachets? There's not going to be necessarily a better or worse with an alkaline water, 9 to 10 pH. What I would say is, is the, the cell performance line uh, utilizes organic compounds. Um, organic compounds don't always play nice with, uh, with high alkalinity or, or really high acidity. Um, and so my recommendation would probably be just take it with normal water 
Um, and then, and then again, use, use the blue bottle, take ARS, a CR redox supplement um, for your cell signaling benefits. Wonderful. Uh, this question is about metal in the mouth. Uh, and I've gotten this several times, braces, you know, fillings, whatever it might be. So the question is, if I've got this stuff in my mouth, is keeping the liquid in my mouth and under my tongue a problem? Because I know I'm supposed to do it to help with absorption, um, but are those metals going to interfere and cause an issue? Sure. Yeah, uh, I get this question actually a lot when we do tours at the plant. Um, so this is this is good that we're addressing this. Um, you are absolutely right that metal and minerals denature signaling molecules. Um, I do want to emphasize, um, if we look at the keywords behind cell signaling products, we know that they work through absorption, right? Now, absorption is very closely tied to surface area. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the surface area of your entire mouth, we're talking under your tongue, on your tongue, cheeks, roof of your mouth, gums, kind of back area, um, the surface area of your mouth is much larger than even somebody who has a lot of fillings, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about a ratio of contact area, if your mouth is this big, you're probably got that much surface area of, of fillings, right? And so does it denature the, pro or the product that comes into contact with your fillings? Yeah. But again, we're talking percentage points here, right? We're talking, okay, so now you're getting 98% instead of 100% take a little bit more if you're really concerned about it. But because the product works through absorption, you have to look at the amount of surface area of contact. And your mouth is much larger from a surface area standpoint than the fillings in your mouth. Wonderful, great explanation. Um, there's a question, when will this be coming to Europe? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was, it was originally launched as an LTO. We wanted to make sure that it was gonna be well received. It has been. Um, we talked about 33 international markets with 33 different uh, regulatory uh, requirements, right? Set of requirements. So we're working on it. Um, we're trying to do it as soon as possible. We want to get this amazing product out to you guys. Um, I don't have an official date for you just yet, but we are working on it. We want it to happen as quickly as possible. And if you come to Texas and you come to convention, it's available in the you U.S. Get some. So you can get yep. some. <laughs> and yep. they're easy Absolutely. To <laughs> yep. Come huh. to convention. Exactly. So do the cell performance products have an expiration date on them? Um, yes. Yes, they do. Uh, it's published by requirement, actually, on a, on every single package. Okay, wonderful. And uh, lots of cell performance. When will you start putting less sweetener in cell performance? <laughs> um, we're, we're working on some, some flavor tweaks right now. Um, there's a lot of inventory in the market right now. Um, so any change that happens, it'll take a little bit of time for it to take effect. Um, the, the thing that's challenging again about that is there are so many different preferences when it comes to flavor profiles. Yeah. Um, and, and, and not only when you consider differences even here in the U.S., but the palate in Europe is very different than the palate in the U.S., which is different from the palate in Asia. There are so many different preferences globally as far as flavor goes. We tried to do our best this time around as far as being you know, acceptable to everybody. The other thing that I want to touch on with cell performance is these products are extremely clean, meaning we try to keep the synthetic flavor enhancers out. We try to use as little um, of, of anything that was not functional as possible. And so really, we don't have a whole lot of flexibility as far as the flavor goes with the current ingredient set. Um, so we're, we're looking at it. We, we, we've heard a couple of a couple of pieces of feedback of make it a little less sweet. Um, we're taking that into account, but it'll take a little bit of time for us to be able to make sure that the product is still effective and stable with some of these changes that are being proposed. Wonderful. All right. I'll just, we've got like two more. So um, people cool. with dentures, should they take out their dentures to swoosh or should they leave the dentures in? And also if you could touch on how long to swoosh, because that is like a debated topic. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't, I don't think it's going to matter. Dentures in, dentures out. Um, yeah, I, it, it, it shouldn't matter in or out. That's going to be a personal preference thing. Um, as far as how long to swish for, um, 
and, and this is a story that I've told several times. So a lot of you've probably heard it is, is I've heard, I've heard people say that they switched for as long as five minutes. Yeah. Um, I think it's amazing that we have individuals in the field that are that dedicated to getting everything they can out of the product. Um, but we have conducted exper experiments here at the Redox Center. And we have found that the vast majority of the signaling molecules are absorbed in the first 15 to 30 seconds of swishing. So we did that here at the plant. We all swished, you know, for different amounts of times. We spit back into the beaker and then we tested for signaling molecules. It was, uh, it was an interesting test, but we were able to confirm 15 to 30 seconds um, is sufficient for, for the absorption to happen. It's hilarious. When you guys said you knew that, I was like, oh my God, they had to have swished it and spit. And I was like, oh, yeah. that. so that's confirmed now. All right. <laughs> um, the last question, I don't know if you can speak to this. They said, any thoughts about subbing out maltodextrin in cell performance? I don't know anything about that ingredient. Yeah, let's talk about that. So that's a, that's a highly villainized ingredient. Um, one of the things, uh, that we have to consider when we're launching products is that we do business internationally. And so there are a lot of different requirements out there. I want to clarify with this group, there is no added maltodextrin to the product. Hmm. The, the source of the maltodextrin is a trace amount using it, used in one of the ingredients that we include in the product. This maltodextrin maintains the integrity of that ingredient from a stability standpoint. And we are talking trace amounts here. It allows it to be flowable. It doesn't clump up. Um, and so there is actually so little maltodextrin in the product um, that from a regulatory standpoint, we have found that we do not have to put it on the box. And so in future packaging, maltodextrin will not be on the box because it is present only in such trace amounts as a flowability and stability agent. There is no added maltodextrin to the product. Um, it was put on the box in an abundance of caution from a regulatory strategy standpoint. So, you know, when you, when you do business in so many markets, you have to be a little more careful. Um, and so we knew that it was present in trace amounts. And so we placed it in on the box as a matter of transparency, right? Um, however, we found from regulations now, because it is such a small amount, it does not even hit the threshold to, to be on the boxes as part of the formula as an ingredient. Okay. That was super insightful. Thank you guys. You asked yeah. wonderful questions Hunter, thank you for <laughs> your time. Um, I also saw people asking, where can I get this interview? So this will be archived as part of the VIP customer group on Facebook. You can find any and all interviews we do. We do one a month. So stay, uh, stay posted on that. It will be there. I've live streamed it as soon as I end it's there. <laughs> so you can tag people in it. Um, I also recorded it. So I will be, for those not on the Facebook platform, I will be uploading it to a SIA United Vimeo channel, a SIA United YouTube channel. Uh, but you're going to need to give me a little bit of time. Uh, so you'll probably see it there this afternoon. And um, I just want to say, Hunter, that was so insightful. <laughs> like, honestly, I, I learned a lot and it's wild because I've been part of this for eight years. And uh, I just am really grateful for Again, the professionalism you bring to this, the insight that you bring to this, and for taking your time on a Saturday morning to connect with all of us. I see the chat blowing up with lots of thank yous. Uh, guys, please, yes, express your appreciation, and maybe we'll get him, him back again. So thank you, Hunter, and have a beautiful day. Absolutely, anytime. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thanks, everybody, for having me. All right, bye, guys.